Hello, I am Angela Suarez with Bentley Systems, and in this video, I'm going to talk about detention ponds, what they are, and how to design one using Bentley software. In this photo, you're looking at a typical detention pond for stormwater management. Here is the inlet of the pond where you see small rocks slowing down the incoming water to minimize erosion. Then there's the pond and here you see the outlet structure. But what is the purpose of a detention pond and how do you go about designing one? This is what we're going to cover in this video. So what we have here is a site before it is developed. Uh, we refer to this as the pre-development condition. And in the bottom left, uh, you see the same site after it has been developed. And we refer to that as a post-development condition. And as you can see in the resulting hydrographs that show how much runoff um, happens, we can see that in the pre-development for the same storm event, in this case a 10-year, we had a peak flow of two cubic feet per second, but after the site was developed, it's increased to about eight CFS. And the same is true for the other storm events. Now, this is why a developer is often required to not exceed the peak outflow that existed before the site was developed. So how does a developer solve this issue? with a detention pond. <laughs> so those pre-developed um, peak flow rates are going to become now the target peak flow rates out of our detention pond that we have here. And the post-development runoff becomes the inflow to the pond. Now, knowing this pond inflow and the target peak outflow rates, we uh, get ready to start our pond design. Now, detention ponds can be dry or wet. Wet ponds, uh, like the one you see in this photo, are designed to maintain a minimum water depth between storms, and therefore they can double up as nice uh, aesthetic elements and they can also serve as settling basins for improving water quality. So there are lots of advantages to them. Um, and there's also the dry ponds, and those are designed to completely dry up between storms. Now in this video, we're going to focus on the hydraulic aspects of pond design, and we're gonna leave the important task of creative landscape design to you. Okay, so as far as the hydraulics is concerned, uh, engineers have to answer three main questions. First, how much volume does the pond need to store so that it's not too small or unnecessarily big? Uh, also, what dimensions should the pond have so it fits in my site? And the third question is, what outlet structures should it have and so it releases the right amount of flow for each storm event? Okay, so let's take a look at each of those questions one at a time. Um, the first one is the storage. Um, how do I figure out the volume of my pond? Uh, well, in this picture, you can see that the storage area uh, shown here in blue is the difference between the inflow, remember our post-development runoff, and the pond's outflow. Now, um, engineers often use the pre-development hydrograph and the post-development hydrograph, and they come up with that area in between. Uh, in our case, the software can do this for you. Um, but what is tricky about this sometimes is the outflow hydrograph, because you haven't really designed the outlet structure yet, so you have to make an estimate for that. Um, and we actually have a tool called Pond Maker. This is available in Civil Storm, Pond Pack, and Sewer Gems. Uh, and you, as you can see here, this is a step-by-step -step guide 
um, through the pond design process. Uh, in fact, there's another YouTube video uh, titled Using Pond Maker to Design a Pond in Under Five Minutes, and I will put a link to it at the end of this video. So back to how do we estimate the pond volume? Um, this image shows the method available in Pond Maker to estimate storage. Um, and again, remember that the unknown part here is the blue outflow hydrograph. Um, so that's what we allow you to do here. Utilize different methods, some more conservative than others uh, for each storm event. So we can figure out the estimated volume to store for each storm event. Now that we have an estimated storage volume, we now have to figure out the pond's dimensions um, that will fit that volume. So let's say you have a limited surface area on the site. And what that means is if you're limited by the area, then all you have to play with is the depth. You can have a pond of any shape, any size, but it can also be a buried pipe or a storage chamber system, uh, like the one we're showing here. Okay, so now we have estimated storage volume. We have the dimensions of our pond. It is time to focus on the outlet structure. So what is an outlet structure? Um, an outlet structure's purpose is to release flow from a pond at a controlled rate. Uh, so it must be sized to meet the target flows for several storm events. Now in this picture, we can see the pond on the left, uh, a standpipe or a riser with multiple orifices. Um, now notice that the flow from the riser and the orifices will pass through a culvert um, to leave the pond. Uh, also notice that detention ponds always should have an overflow spillway um, to safely convey discharge when the design capacity is exceeded if you have a very large storm event. So those can be called overflow spillways, emergency spillways, Here's a front view of another outlet structure. Um, this one has a triangular weir that allows flow into an inlet box and then out the culvert. And notice that this pond also has an overflow spillway. Okay, now that we know the purpose of an outlet structure, let's get into the hydraulics of designing one. And this is where you can expect to spend a decent amount of time designing. Um, so first of all, an outlet structure must be connected to a single pond upstream. And then downstream, uh, an outlet structure can discharge to a free outfall, or it could be connected to another pond where flow can go in forward and reverse directions. Now, as we saw in the previous slides, outlet structures can be any combination of orifices, risers, culverts, weirs, uh, vortex valves, etc. And it is up to you to determine which of these elements you will include in your outlet structure. Uh, we're going to go over each element type shortly, but I'd like to explain the graph here on the right. The dark blue line shows you the expected flow through the entire or the composite outlet structure that we call uh, at different levels in the pond. So for example, you can see that the bottom of this pond is at 95 feet and the top at 100. And when the water elevation in the pond is 97.5 feet, the expected flow through the composite outlet structure is 2.5 CFS. And when the pond is full at 100, um, expected flow is 17.5 CFS. Okay. Uh, now, a nice thing about this is that as you modify the elements in your outlet structure, this dark blue line will shift and you want it to be as close as possible to the cyan line. This cyan line is your target rating curve, meaning that you should aim at designing an outlet structure which closely follows that curve. But where does that cyan curve come from? The cyan line is an interpolation of, in this case, three points in the graph. Okay, Each point represents the intersection of our target flows, remember our pre-development, peak flows, the soft work. Okay, so to figure out this value here, the maximum water elevation, um, it is calculated from the estimated storage volume and the pond dimensions that we entered in previous steps. 
So to explain this, let's pretend that we have this glass measuring jar and the jar represents my pond, the dimensions that I've entered. And the water, which is blue here, represents the estimated storage volume. So here you can see that a storage volume of a third of a cup results in a water elevation of 2.5 inches, right? So we knew the estimated storage volume, we knew the dimensions of our pond, the software just calculated this maximum water elevation uh, for each of those storm events. Okay, so those are the dotted pink, green, and red lines. So um, at these intersections, it basically puts a point and then it just interpolates and that's how uh, we come up with that target line. Now that we understand the importance of our cyan line, that target rating curve, we can see how if we deviate towards the red zone here, the outlet structure that we're designing is too large. So we would be letting too much water out and exceeding our target flow rates. But also if we deviate towards the green zone, the outlet structure would be too small and we'd be restricting too much flow. So you don't have to be really, really close. There's usually a tolerance like plus or minus 10% of the target flow rates. So we want to get as close to it, but don't spend too long here. So how do I know which elements to include in my outlet structure? The truth is this is a trial and error process, but understanding how each element behaves can help you in your initial selection. And then once you come up with your initial selection, it's a matter of changing the number of elements, for example, the number of uh, orifices that you have, uh, their elevation within the outlet structure, their diameter, um, you know, true for any other structure type. Um, and you just play with those variables until you get to your target flows. So let's take a look at them one, one at a time, weirs. Um, here are three different kinds of weirs, rectangular suppressed weir, rectangular contracted weir, a triangular or V-notched weir. Uh, as you can see in this photo, weirs start allowing flow after the water level reaches the crest. Um, this, this is the crest. And the rating curve is um, a generally mild sloping curve like you see here. These are the uh, flow equations for a suppressed and contracted weir. So it's, you don't have to memorize this, you know, the software is calculating all these flows for you, but you have to uh, understand where these numbers come from. Okay, how about orifices? Um, flow through an orifice starts when the water level reaches the orifice, and then it increases as the water level in the pond increases, and therefore the water pressure uh, on, the, on the orifice. If you want to look at the flow equation through an orifice, um, it's here. So we can see what the rating curve through an orifice is, and it's generally a steep sloping curve. Okay, um, risers. Flow through a riser starts when the water level reaches the top of the structure, like here in these cases. Uh, that's also the top of the structure is uh, also called an inlet and it behaves first as a weir so if you see the water is uh, just slightly above it flows like a waterfall right but as the riser is fully submerged it starts acting as an orifice so if you're gonna think of the rating curve through a riser you can see that it first behaves as a weir later as an orifice and in between there's a transition zone uh, culverts Culverts are similar to a pipe, except they can be inlet or outlet controlled. Uh, we determine that based on the equations in the HDS5. The rating curve for a culvert tends to be steep, uh, but if you are using a large diameter for your culvert, or the larger the diameter, the milder the, the culvert rating curve becomes. Another element is the vortex valve. Uh, vortex valves were actually very popular in Europe and now we're seeing them more and more in North America. The way they work is that at low heads, the device acts similar to an orifice. Um, so you can see that here in the rating curve. 
Uh, and what happens is that as the head increases, the swirl at the entrance creates a vortex and that vortex restricts the outflow. So it becomes all of a sudden really steep. And the result is that the rating curve is shaped like an S, as you see here. A nice advantage of vortex valves is that they can reduce clogging because they can let debris pass through the vortex. Okay, so let me show you um, how this looks like in the software. Um, here we have our pond maker worksheet. And you can see that for the outlet structure, I see the rating curve for the orifice that I've entered. I can also see the rating curve for the riser. And I can look at the composite outlet structure, which combines both the riser and orifice. And I can also look at the rating table. So it can tell me at which sur water surface elevation um, the structures are contributing. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like. If you want to see more such series, consider subscribing to our channel. Thank you, and see you next time.